Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jean-Yves Moncomble, and I am uh, the chair of the Committee on Energy of the WFEO. WFEO is the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. I am very happy to welcome you on behalf on, of uh, WFEO uh, to this uh, symposium dedicated to energy transition and COVID-19 crisis, the role of engineers. Without taking more time, I will uh, thank uh, Professor Gonke. Professor Gonke is the president of our organization, the World Federation of Engineering Organization. And I am very happy uh, to give him the floor for a keynote speech. Professor Gonke, it's yours. Thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. Uh, at first, I would like to welcome you all to this very important uh, webinar. I say it is uh, very important because I do believe the topic today, uh, engineering transition and uh, <clears throat> the role of engineers is a very challenging topic to uh, every engineers across the world. Now I try to uh, present uh, <clears throat> some personal view to this topic uh, for your uh, criticization. So please allow me to use a relatively long name, engineer responsible to energy transition for sustainable development and the building the world back better and wiser from the COVID. Uh, <clears throat> let's start uh, from the, the recently uh, released report from IPCC that's released uh, in early August. In this report, you see this curve is observed uh, climate change. And uh, this curve is simulated climate change with human and the natural <clears throat> behaviors. And this is simulated natural only uh, impacts. So we see uh, the scientific evidence shows the man-made impact to the climate change. And this report, is called a, a red, uh, the code red by the uh, 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 Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, a uh, 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 code red to humanity. So here you can see uh, the picture, which is uh, uh, based on the data in the year 2013, <clears throat> before the Paris Agreement. And this shows globally the primary sources of greenhouse gas emission are at first electricity and heat, agriculture, transportation, forestry, and manufacturing. Energy production of all types accounts for around 72% uh, of all emissions. And <clears throat> after a few years until uh, 2019, according to the assessment, again, uh, <clears throat> by the IPCC, the emission, the proportion, uh, the proportion of electricity and heat production induced carbon emissions is still increase. Uh, here we see uh, uh, another type of emission uh, keep the same uh, or reduced but the electricity and heat production, as well as the transportation is still uh, uh, increased. That is uh, 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 far uh, beyond uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the track, which is uh, specified by the uh, Paris uh, uh, Agreement. Here again, <laughs> you can see a newest report last year, released last year. The percentage of energy related greenhouse gas emission has increased to 73.2%, uh, even larger uh, than the year 2018. And here you see uh, the part uh, of the energy use in industry, uh, which is dealing with uh, iron and steel industry, uh, transportation, other industries, food, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> they are all uh, uh, engineering and engineers relevant. So this is to alarm us on the urgency of energy transition. 
engineering and all engineers are responsible to implement the energy transition and to shape a net zero carbon world. That is the meaning for the build back better and wiser from the COVID. We're not going back to the situation like this. We're going to build back better and wiser. So two weeks ago, uh, on the 24th uh, September, the United Nations convenes a special high level dialogue on the energy. In the opening remarks to this uh, high level dialogue, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres said, without deep and rapid decarbonization of our energy system over the next 10 years, we will never reach the Paris Agreement goal of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. And he said, this, is, this will be fatal to the sustainable development goals to us all and the planet. Science has shown us exactly how to avoid it. To limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we must reduce emissions by 45% below 2010 levels by 2030 and reach net zero emission by 2050. Let us have a closer look to the SDG 7, which is affordable and clean energy. Under this goal, there are three targets. The targets one is by 2030, ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services. However, assessed by the United Nations in its Global Sustainable Report 2019, just before the COVID, we see the energy poverty remain extensive with 840 billion people lacking access to electricity, predominantly in sub uh, Saharan Africa, and more than 3 billion people relying on pollution solid foil for cooking, which causes an estimate 3.8 million premature deaths each year. And the target two under the uh, SDG 7 is by 2030, increase substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. Again, pointed in uh, SDG, uh, the, the United Nations uh, uh, report 2019. <clears throat> It, is, uh, uh, it tells us the energy-related greenhouse gas emission reached historical high of 33 gigaton in 2018. This is far from being on track to meet the Paris objectives. According to the IPCC, if current demand trends continue, renewables will need to supply 70 to 85% of electricity in 2050, but it is only 12.4% in 2018. Under a business as usual scenario, it may be expected only 22% in 2050. There's a big gap. Therefore, decarbonization of energy sources needs to speed up by triple that means 2.7% per year to reach the target. The third target under the SDG 7 is by 2030, double the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. Improvements in energy efficiency will be critical under a business as usual scenario <coughs> As, uh, estimated uh, by the United Nations report 2019, the demand for energy is expected to rise by 25% in 2040. 
due to rising incomes and to a growing population, particularly in the urban areas of developing countries. And again, this increase could be significantly higher if not for continued improvements in energy efficiency. So <clears throat> in this mentioned report, Global Sustainable Report 2019, which is titled The Future is Now, Science for Achieving Sustainable Development Goals. A new model for integrated implementation of the SDGs has been proposed in which six entry points are mentioned. Among them, energy decarbonization with access, uh, with universal access is uh, one of the ent entry point. And the four levers is uh, <clears throat> raised, raised up, among which science and technology is an important one. Here we see the cross, uh, cross point uh, of the science technology as a lever at the entry point of energy decarbonization and the, uh, universal access. I think that is the area uh, for uh, us engineers to act. So we need to uh, carry out a comprehensive energy transition, or in, in other words, energy uh, revolution, including high efficient and cheaper renewable energy, safe, reliable, and efficient long-term storage, scalable and economic carbon capture utility and storage technology, and negative emission technologies smart, resilient, and effective transmission uh, distribution and operation and management. Widely and clean electrification of end uses and efficient usage, and much more. And this means using all of the available tools to advance the transformation to accessible and decarbonization, uh, uh, decarbonization uh, energy. The potential for progress is clear through a rapid scale up of renewable energy, modernization of the electricity transport, storage and distribution, and electrification of energy and uses. At the same time, new and improved technologies are also needed, especially in smart grid management and development, interconnection, interconnection with neighboring regions, flexible generation, demand response, long-term and cost-effective energy and electricity storage, and energy sources for some transport modes. Research and development should support the necessary infrastructure for key technologies, including for heating and cooling networks, charging stations for electric vehicles, and microgrids for distributed energy generation. Power stations need to be designed to allow for high renewable energy penetration rates, and the digital technologies can be deployed to improve the efficiency of distribution and availability of energy. And another important point is the clean energy and the gender inequality. It is pointed out by the uh, Global Sustainable Development Report. A stark figure reminds us that the 2030 agenda will fail if we allow people to be left behind. 90% of the over 65 billion people worldwide who have forcibly displaced from their homes and living without access to electricity. The gender dimensions of energy transition are often overlooked, but are important. 
I think that would be not overlooked in our webinar. So to conclude uh, uh, my speech, I would like to repeatedly uh, um, stress these three points. First, energy transition is imperative and of great urgent to sustain humankind and the, pla and the planet. Second, all engineers are responsible to this comprehensive energy revolution in both supply and demand sides. The World Federation of Engineering Organization unites and is activating all engineers, men and women, to engage into the energy revolution so that to build the world better and wiser from the COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zonke, for this uh, very, very interesting uh, keynote speech. I think that you, you have uh, provided us uh, the global framework for our, uh, uh, our session, and I am very happy for that. Uh, I, I, I want to, to thank you very much for, uh, for that. Um, Thank you. I, 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 perhaps I will take a, a few minutes in order to present uh, the global, to give a global uh, overview of our uh, symposium. Uh, and I just want to begin by uh, recalling uh, the context of our uh, symposium. Uh, and on some point, I will uh, follow what you have already said. Just to remember that uh, over a year ago, uh, we were, uh, there were many debates on the energy transition. And uh, we, at this time, uh, the stakes uh, were mainly environmental with the fight against climate change, as you have underlined, and also the loss of biodiversity, uh, which, are, which were at the top of the list. The composition of the energy mix, the capacity of our societies to evolve uh, toward other modes of transport, and the consequence of the emergence of digital uh, uh, technology were discussed to name, but a few of the debates that were very present in the world before. And the COVID-19 pandemic has struck our societies in a brutal, powerful, and unexpected way, disrupting the lives of uh, every, each and everyone. While it threatens us with generalized disintegration, our societies are showing strong resistance and resilience. At the forefront of the caregiver are the caregivers uh, in the broadest sense of the word, from those who work in direct confrontation with the virus, to all those who provide the indispensable logistic, and there are many engineers among them. But if our society is all together, if it is also sung to all those more or less visible who allow the economy to continue to function and provide access to vital services, water and sanitation, waste treatment, energy, of course, the food chain, the internet and communication, the way to transport, and the list is, is long, of course. And there are also all those who are mobilized to ensure information, education system, cultural dissemination, and all the initiative of solidarity and aid to the poorest anywhere in the world. How could we have faced the health crisis if, in addition, the power plants has stopped off, or if we have lacked fuels. The health crisis is far from over, even if it is slowing down, perhaps temporarily, in some countries. For more one year, for more than one year, sorry, our forces and resources have been focused on fighting the virus. But why they may have stalled as, as the global economy the environmental challenges are still with us and will become even more acute as the global economy recovers. More than ever, the transition we were engaged in before the pandemic are proving indispensable as it has been just uh, underlined by Professor Gonke. These transitions are often linked and their environmental and social components are even more important after the crisis. And this challenge will have to be faced in a world impo impoverished and exhausted by the health crisis. More than ever, the notion of optimization, the notion of resilience or efficiency will be the keystone of the system to be rebuilt. These are the world of engineers. 
I want just to provide you, you a global view on what will be the program, the agenda of our, uh, of our uh, symposium. We will have uh, five sessions. Uh, the two sessions will be today, and the three other sessions will be tomorrow, roughly at the same time. The first session is dedicated to resilience of energy system to COVID crisis, and mainly the feedback of our experiment. All along the COVID-19 crisis, energy supply in all countries and world region has been ensured at any time. Hence, on one, on, on one hand, the pandemic has highlighted highlight that the underlying energy system, technologies, and transport system are substantially resilient, although this has required a proactive engagement from energy utilities in this unpredictable context. On the other hand, the continuous and stable energy supply has enabled the sanitary sector to work on its gargantuan effort by powering critical hospital infrastructure as well as other crucial activities. How did this happen? And what has been concretely been put in place to manage this crisis situation? It will be the, our first session. The, first, the second session will be dedicated to think about a larger definition for resilience and perhaps a new understanding of risks. The COVID-19 pandemic really disrupted our economies and lifestyle, but the climate and emergency or the loss of biodiversity are still with us. But health risk and cyber risk are examples of new threats to the resilience of energy systems. How has this new risk be, been sufficiently taken into account? How are they integrated into our thinking and how do they modify our understanding of the transition we are experiencing. Tomorrow, we will begin with the third session. The third session will be dedicated to energy demand, and we will think about evolution or disruption of this uh, energy demand. The COVID-19 crisis included new threat linked to the, its easy transfer between humans and between materials and humans. This introduced uh, social constraints affecting primarily either public transportation or safety requirements in building air conditioning or maintenance. It introduced new or reverse trends that might influence our societies beyond the, causes, the COVID crisis itself. Examples are the preference for safer transportation or the trend toward decentralized, greener and less dense habitats. The reliance on internet-based channels, but also on new locally-based shopping venues, has impact the previous equilibrium. But does this mean that the change will remain at the end of the crisis, or that elasticity phenomena will bring back incumbent actor and behavior? It is, it is a very important question. The fourth session will be dedicated, after the demand side, on the supply side. And two major questions concerning the behavior of citizens will determine the path of future transition. Globalization has been identified as partly responsible for the current crisis. We, we continue along the path of what some described as unbridled globalization, or will we return to lifestyles refocused on the local, or we will find a more balanced path? Cooperation and solidarity on the second part are values that have returned to the public debate. Once the crises are over, will we keep the memory of them in mind in order to build our after pandema, pandemia world? Last session will be a, a round table. And uh, this uh, round table will be dedicated to lessons learned so far and focus on the role of engineers. It is essential to develop sustainable, resilient, and inclusive energy system, as it has been said by Professor Gonke. Reflection must be based on facts, rigorous, and without preconception, without ideology. To achieve this objective, all energy options are possible, depending on national context. Engineers have a role to play in informing choice by adopting systemic approaches that put forward mature, immediately available technologies that contribute significantly to the fight against climate change and biodiversity loss. 
and the objective of the role of this uh, of the role of, of this uh, roundtable will be to discuss about uh, mainly what will be the role in uh, of the engineer during uh, this very important evolution so globally what is the project of this uh, today's uh, symposium i hope uh, that uh, of course it will be interesting uh, for everyone i am sure that because of the quality of our speakers uh, i just want to add uh, that uh, we will have uh, proceedings of uh, this uh, symposium and of course uh, all the people who are uh, registered to our symposium will receive the, produce, the proceeding of this uh, wfeo symposium so if you agree with a few minutes in advance, but it's better than to be late, uh, we will go on the first uh, session of uh, our uh, of our meeting. And uh, I have, uh, sorry, I take my notes. <laughs> and uh, for the session number one, which is uh, dedicated to resilience of energy system to COVID-19 crisis feedback, experience feedback, I will have the pleasure to have uh, two, uh, two speakers. Uh, Miguel Fierro on one side, Abu Bakar Sambo on the other side, and I will uh, very quickly give the floor to the first speaker, uh, Miguel Fierro, who is the vice president of the Uruguayan Engineering Association. Miguel, you will give us uh, a speech about the COVID-19 crisis, energy and engineers in Uruguay. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you, John. Thank you, Gonki. Thank you, the WFEO, for inviting me and accepting me uh, to this um, conference or seminar, or how they call you. Um, um, I've been working in, in the company, in an energy company of Uruguay, uh, since uh, March of 1993, 28 years uh, working in that company. Uh, uh, now I'm, I am vice president of the uh, Asociación de Ingenieros del Uruguay in Spanish, and I, I'll be uh, president of, of the association the, the last four years. If you, if you are ready, I'm going to share the screen of my presentation, and I will start speaking. So. Okay. It's okay. Now, can you see it? You hear me well? Yes, it's clear. Okay. It's perfect. Well, the title of my presentation is a COVID-19 crisis, energy and engineers in, in Uruguay. Um, in our country, in, in Uruguay, on the 13th of March, um, there was the, 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 the government declared a sanitary emergency because they are detected the first uh, COVID-19 infections in our country. It was uh, Friday, um, we were in summer, the, and uh, in, in, in the weekend, the, 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 the chairman of our company had to work very much so that in the 18th of March, we, we, um, we started uh, to establish a, a protocol to, for the operative tasks in normal circumstances and as well as in COVID-19 contingency. And now I am going to try to describe our company uh, that it was found, it's called uh, UTE. In, in English, it's, it seems uh, Administration of Electric Power Plants and Transmissions. It was created in October 21 of 1912 uh, by uh, law and the number of the law was 
4,273. It is the only uh, energy company in, in Uruguay. We have only one company that is um, a state company. Um, well, it is a, a, an internal public, a person of internal public law, and it, it has the degree of uh, autonomy technique determined by the norms of the constitutional rank uh, and relative to the decentralized entities of the industrial and commercial domain uh, of the states. Well, in, in our country, the whole electrical energy supply is uh, throughout the Euro authorities provided by this company, by UTE. And the service reaches around 99% of the population. Um, in, in this period, um, in this from, from, from now to 2025, we are uh, running forward to reach the the 100 percentage of the population, though that is the plan uh, of the of the board of the chair board in in these um, five years, next five years. Um, it is very important to outline that the the recent development of the electrical energy matrix in Uruguay uh, had reached the 98 percent of the energy it supplied. Uh, and generated from renewable sources. We are, Uruguay is the second largest producer of clean energy in the world. And we are leaders in renewable energies. Um, and the company, and a description of the generation of the company. The company possesses hydroelectric, wind and photovoltaic power plants, as well as the essential support of thermal energy. And uh, we have, the company has 1.4 million users. And uh, we also export energy into uh, to our neighbors countries, uh, Argentina and Brazil. We, are, uh, we have interconnections with Argentina through the Salto Grande hydroelectric power, it's a binational um, um, hydroelectric plant, power plant. And we also um, have uh, in interconnection with Brazil through the frequency convergence stations located in the cities of Rivera and Melo that are uh, uh, near the border with Brazil. And that, uh, that um, condition strengthens the Uruguayan power grid and improves energy flexibility. Uruguay uh, um, has it, uh, is autosufficient in, in, in energy generation. And we also uh, export energy to our neighbors. Uh, well, the the, the item that um, of this um, part of the conference was uh, the resilience of energy systems to COVID-19 crisis. And what was uh, our experience in the company? So we can give you a feedback. Um, in, in when, when, we, when we established the protocols uh, in March of last year, um, uh, 220, uh, the protocol was implemented for both uh, administer administrative task and field work because Ute, uh, the company has, um, it's a vertical company, has uh, all uh, generation, transmission, uh, distribution and commercialized energy. Uh, so we have to, um, to um, implement two kinds of protocols for administrative, administrative uh, uh, people, uh, workers, and field workers. Regarding the administrative work, uh, tasks, um, remote work, work was established in, in all offices 
where, where possible, so as to reduce the risk of, of, of infection. I want to, to say also that in Uruguay, we have the largest fiber optic and telephone coverage in the region. So it, was, um, it, it wasn't difficult to uh, implement um, la, what, what, what we call uh, work from home. Then in, in um, field work, permanent teams were defined for operative tasks with weekly rotation. So uh, they can remain is isolated from each other and um, to, to, to prevent uh, infections between the teams. These measures uh, resulted on a 50% reduction on the daily workforce because half of the the, the teams were at home and the other half were working on the field. But the electric service, the operation and maintenance of the distribution networks, it remained unaffected. In storage facilities, we have uh, uh, both kind of works. Um, so we have to establish mixed measures as it is considered that both we have both administrative and operational tasks uh, in, in solar facilities. Um, similar procedures was set for the generation plants and in transmission departments, always considering the nature of the works and also in, in the, the, the workforce for the distribution network. Um, also, we have restrictions, we impose restrictions of customer services. Uh, students were reduced and, uh, and we started an advertising campaign uh, that promoted the use of remote communications tools for customers, such as, as WhatsApp, mobile apps, the web page, SMS, um, try to, to, to um, give the customers another kind of um, of communication with the company, not uh, face to face. Um, another uh, uh, restriction that we is, uh, established in 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 the task force was uh, the electric meter readings. We and delivery of documents. In Uruguay, we are starting to, uh, we are uh, um, uh, installing um, um, smart meters, but we uh, have not reached uh, at today the 100% the of the customers. We are looking forward to, to install um, five, 2,500 meters per year, uh, um, smart meters per year, so as we can reach the 100% of the customers with smart meters in 2025. So um, the electric meter reader readings and the little readings documents where, where we only make them where we have no uh, uh, access to the customer's homes and in order to also to avoid the reduction of and reduce the infection risks. And in, in technical commercial services, only prior, priority activities were carried out, such as uh, new customers connections, uh, rate changes and increasing increases of power. Uh, well, uh, what was the result of all these uh, measures, um, and and how we 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 have to change um, practically daily or monthly because of the, um, the of the changes of the sanitary situation in the country? Well, we started in March of uh, two thousand twenty with with. Uh, 
COVID crisis. And near um, uh, November or December of 2020, the infections increased. So we have to, to change and, and modify uh, our protocols. And, and now, um, actual, in, the, in the actual time, uh, we have the 100% uh, of the administrative uh, workers uh, when working face to face, and the 75% of the um, task force um, working in in in, in work, working face to face. Um, almost in the we are after almost 18 months since the sanitary emergency was declared in Uruguay. And the company has adapted to its new modalities of work without affecting the service. We are also um, trying to rule the work from home that we weren't prepared, we didn't have any rules for work from home. Um, so we have to, um, the, to hear the people of human resources of the company and the board directors have to try to um, make some rules for home work from home. And finally, I, I want to um, take a look at how many engineers we have in, in Uruguay so that you have an idea that we are a, a very little country with uh, three and a half million of, of people approximately. And um, in Uruguay, there are approximately 5,500 engineers working in, in our country. Uh, over 1,300 engineers of several disciplines work at UTE. And in the Association of Engineers de Uruguay, we have 1,050 engineers that are members of our uh, association. Well, that's all for me. Thank you very much. I'm Thank you. Going to stop sharing screen. And if you have any question, and I know the question are now or after the, the next presentation. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation about the Uruguayan case. Um, uh, just uh, I, I don't I say nothing about the, uh, the question and answer about each session. Uh, two remarks. First, answering your question, I propose to have uh, between the speaker a, a short debate after the two presentations. Uh, okay. And to all the people who are uh, listening to us, I want to say to them that they can begin to ask for questions using the chat. Uh, of our uh, of our uh, session, uh, and it will be it is the best way to 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 have to to set question for our uh, our speakers. So, if you agree, we will uh, go on on uh, Abu Bakar Sambo, uh, Professor Sambo. Are you with us always? Are you always with us? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, I am very happy to give the floor now to yes. Abu Bakar yes. Sambo. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh... Abu Bakr Mr. Chairman, Sambo, I'm with you. Can you let me share my screen? Just a minute. Just let me just say a word. Just to say, just to say that uh, you are the chair of uh, the uh, Nigerian World Energy Council uh, Committee, and uh, we know each other for a long time. And I am very happy to welcome you and to give you yes. the floor to speak about uh, the the case of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The floor is yours. That's right. Thank you very much. Can you let me share my screen? Yes, I think. Uh, Can you let me share my screen? Is it? I think. Yes. Yeah. Usually, you, you, you could. Uh, you Are you seeing it now? Yes, we yes. see you. We, is we it there? Yes, it's okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's okay. It's okay, Abu Bakar. We see your screen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As you mentioned, I'm the chairman of the Nigerian chapter of World Energy Council. 
but I'm still in the university, uh, Usman Danfordio University, Faculty of Engineering and Environmental Design. I'm a professor there. Now, I, my presentation is looking at, uh, as you mentioned correctly, Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole. So therefore it has to be very general. I cannot be too specific. I just gave a few examples of my country and uh, in uh, making the presentation, I decided to make it into five small sections. The first one will be a brief description of COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then that will be followed by the major problem we have there. And that is about uh, electricity access and then I will discuss the way forward to strengthen the power sector because my view and many sub-Saharan Africa is that until and unless we improve electricity supply, we cannot develop the system to be able to handle future pandemics effectively. And then I will discuss uh, the role of engineers in line with what the president has already mentioned and I'll round up with a conclusion in the usual manner. Now, to begin with, I want to inform this important uh, forum that Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm sure all of us agree, was a part of the world that was very negatively impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. And that was because of two major reasons. Number one, the economies of those Sub-Saharan nations that were weak went into recession. And the second reason was that in many of the Sub-Saharan African countries with very poor economic uh, status, their citizens almost went into starvations because of the lockdown, because many of them were depending on local daily income to survive. And of course, on the issue of uh, the weak economies that went into recession, I want to say it was those countries like my own that have been essentially depending on income from oil and gas for their foreign exchange earnings. Now, the recovery plans I have surveyed and I discovered recovery plans of most Sub-Saharan African nations as a result of the pandemic is first to significantly strengthen their power sectors so that other developments can follow suit. And in that regard, due consideration, many of them have made uh, on the UN's Sustainable Development Goal, number seven, as the president has uh, uh, beautifully explained, and of course, the other one, SDG 13 on climate change consideration. Now, most sub-Saharan African nations have come up with what can be described as this economic recovery and growth plans that are based on four components. Number one, to tap on large scale agriculture and agro allied industries. Number two, to set up uh, mining and mineral processing plants, and then to set up manufacturing industries in areas with comparative advantages. And the fourth one is to improve their tourism side. Now, the critical role of engineers in strengthening the African electricity supply industry, as well as in modernizing agriculture, mining, and uh, manufacturing, as well as tourism, cannot be overemphasized. With this, I want to move to the issue of poor electricity access in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm sure uh, we know out of the total figure that the president mentioned, uh, more than three quarters are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the IEEA recently, that's about two years ago, came up with something very shocking. And that was while the average electricity consumption per capita of the world, was about 2,600 kilowatt hour. That of Sub-Saharan Africa was about one fifth, that's 500 kilowatt hour. And while the world average electricity access today is about 87% in Sub-Saharan Africa is 43. Now this map that I took from the IEA shows the whole of Africa, not just Sub-Saharan Africa. You can see North Africans are almost okay. But even in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are a number of countries that are getting it right. Kenya's uh, 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 electricity access is 85%, just like that of Ghana. And of course, Angola is very high. It's about uh, 92%, Gabon, sorry, 92%. And South Africa is 94%. But the bulk, majority of Sub-Saharan Africa, it is very poor. Even my own country, 
is only 62%. So uh, to strengthen the economies, to build the, the manufacturing plants, to be able to withstand the future pandemics properly without the economies uh, going down into recession and without the people almost starving, we need to sort out the electricity sector first. But the surprising thing is that while the access is very poor, Africa is well endowed with energy resources, conventional and renewable in reasonably large quantities. Of course, solar energy is the largest, as you can see from this uh, slide. And in fact, if you take the totality of Africa, it is the continent with the highest solar radiation intensity. And this means that in strengthening the electricity sector, Okay, now the, the major challenges uh, identified uh, in a study we did at the World Energy Council about four or five years ago, we discovered the five major problems of Sub-Saharan Africa. Number one is that energy uh, infrastructure is in grossly inadequate. Second one, the capacity of Africans in terms of uh, uh, human capacity and manufacturing capability is also grossly inadequate. Then, of course, the third one is the issue of inadequate investments in energy development. And the fourth one, the policies are weak. Uh, and in many situations, these, the regulatory mechanisms and the laws also are absent. In fact, we were shocked to discover in some sub-Saharan Africa, even there's no comprehensive energy policies to drive their electricity sector. And then the, the fifth one is issue, of course, you know, uh, lack of good governance, uh, mutual confidence among the states uh, that prevents joint projects. And this lack of good governance is also associated with non-transparent transactions that is often uh, described as corruption. And then we see that really for the private sector groups, there are three big opportunities. Number one, with a huge population of Africa, it's, it's a big opportunity for developers to, to come and tap in the energy market. And then the demand for energy would continue to rise due to demand for improved energy services in Africa. And this will require heavy financial investments in energy infrastructure. Opportunities for businesses abound. And then there is also opportunities for cooperation uh, between member states. And this cooperation is being cemented by the regional groups and then by the African Union as a whole. Now, I want to quickly say that to energize Sub-Saharan Africa for meaningful socioeconomic uh, uh, growth will require each of the nations to do three major things. Number one, to produce comprehensive scenario-based demand projections using modern energy modeling tools. Second, and the tools should be used on short, medium, and long-term time horizons covering major economic sectors of industries household services, and of course, transport. And then the last uh, thing they have to do is, like I picked my country, this is an example of energy demand we use in the office that I headed before. That is the Energy Commission of Nigeria that has used a tool we obtained from UK called 2050 Pathway Calculator. We think it's good. We modified it to fit Nigerian situation. And this is the kind of figures we got and uh, government has started to use this kind of uh, plan. So without good plan, we can forget about solid electricity system in sub-Saharan Africa. Then I want to say the way forward, like I said, first of all, to, 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 to produce is to use the United Nations Sustainable Development for All Initiatives that the president has uh, mentioned beautifully, so I don't need to mention them again. And then the next one is to support transboundary projects from one African country to another, which African Union is promoting under the new partnership for African Development, NEPAD. And then the next one is to support the regional energy projects. You know, we have five groups, the West African group, East African group, the Central African group, the Southern African group and the Arab Maghreb Union. Uh, they are doing beautiful projects on energy. And the next one is to use these reports of studies of the World Energy Council, like uh, issues monitor 
And <clears throat> the most recent one on, 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 on uh, energy trilemma index. Then of course, we have to embrace elements of integrated resource. And like I said, we were shocked to discover many African countries don't have even good plans. And the IRP simply, uh, they are roadmaps that large utilities use to plan for power generation. Uh, of course, over time horizons, five, 10, 20, or even more years. And IRPs examine for suitable future resources with regard to transmission lines, substations, and so on and so forth. And they provide means of assessing cost effectiveness of various supply options. And uh, they promote enhanced transparency as well. A good IRP uh, should be fully integrated and it should be prepared by a very wide group of stakeholders in, in the various uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Now, on energy transition, I want to say that having noted that the sustainable development goals as agreed upon by the UN and the Paris Climate Change Talks of 2015 were unlikely to limit global rise to 150, then IEA produced roadmap uh, uh, or to net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 25. As I said, I believe this is going to be uh, widely accepted by majority of countries in the forthcoming Climate Change Conference COP26 that is coming up uh, 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 in, in Glasgow, UK. Now, global temperature rise, arising largely from combustion of fossil fuels, as we all know, is the principal cause of global warming with devastating effects. For Africa, there's another reason why Sub-Saharan Africa should be serious about that. And that was because even uh, at 2013, uh, African countries received a report from United Nations Framework Convention Against Climate Change, UNFCC. And the African Union agreed that climate change is also an African problem. And therefore they all decided to produce their nationally determined contributions for abating climate change. My country, Nigeria, has done two reports so far. July submitted a second NDC, and essentially the NDCs should significantly focus more, and they are doing that on renewable energy for electrification and electric vehicles in the entire transportation value chain. Now, uh, regarding renewable strategies, uh, I'm aware several African countries have problems. Some of them don't even, unfortunately, agree to, to, to go for renewable energy. But I, I found a report in the African Business Edition of September last year, very important, uh, because it, uh, it came with a number of uh, points. The main key thing that uh, I want to highlight here is that the South African uh, uh, model that is now accepted all over the world, that is a renewable energy independent power procurement program which is an auction-based uh, arrangement to, is doing very well. And this is the, 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 the strategy that I am recommending for all Sub-Saharan Africans so that they can significantly expand their renewable energy uptake, especially solar, solar photovoltaics, because the cost has gone significantly down. Now, there's another point that I want to raise. My country is the largest in the uh, uh, processor of gas in Africa. And because of that, it came with a very clear policy that it is going to continue to use gas. Uh, of course, we know gas, even though it has uh, a significant carbon footprint, it is about half of that of coal. Uh, and the Nigerian government is saying they, they will use it alongside with uh, uh, um, renewable energy power plants. And the government came a few months ago to declare that uh, this uh, next 10 years is the uh, Nigerian decade for gas. And it declared also that uh, um, its plan to use gas is for the next 128 years. And that uh, they got the National Assembly to pass the petroleum industry bill, which the president has signed into law and that will harmonize and update the several petroleum laws and make Nigerians 
to have more benefits from that sector. Uh, the recent policy declaration in Nigeria also involved a number. The Nigerian government came out to say the country would maximize domestic utilization to energize the Nigerian economy. And the government was taking proactive carbon reduction position, driving massive uptake in renewables investments and facilitating the much desired regulatory and policy reforms. And then the government also came with very heavy fines for those uh, companies that will continue to flaring gas. And the uh, government came with some uh, um, uh, measures that will reduce use of uh, automotive gas oil and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and petrol, and instead more gas will be utilized. And I believe the 13 other sub-Saharan African nations that are well endowed with oil and gas will take positions similar to what Nigeria has done. Now, I, I want to quickly jump to this electricity generation expansion plan that my group, the Nigerian chapter of the World Energy Council recently came up with, and we're in discussion with Nigerian government as a pathway for Nigerian electricity supply industry to meet the requirements of the demand projection that I discussed earlier. And you can see that because we need to carry our colleagues in the oil and gas, we do not say stop using uh, the, the fossil fuel completely. But you can see at the end, we are going to have about 85% based on renewable energy as the power supply options. And the kind of things that we are recommending for sub-Saharan African countries is several of this kind of 50 megawatts solar photovoltaic plant commissioned in June in Togo, or like the 310 megawatts wind power plant commissioned in uh, Kenya in July, two years ago. And uh, with this, Mr. Chairman, I want to jump quickly to, to towards the end of my presentation by highlighting six of the major areas we in Nigeria believe sub-Saharan African countries uh, uh, can focus on. And I want to say that the post-COVID economic recovery and growth plans of the sub-Saharan African nations cannot materialize unless and until engineers are fully involved in the following steps. Number one, engineers will be the ones to design the various electricity plants, especially the energy transition ones, and they will produce and implement uh, the roadmaps. Number two, as the electricity generation expansion plan I just explained of nations like Nigeria will have some sizable carbon footprints, engineers will have to work with other specialists to design carbon capture sequestration plants and forestry plantation to serve as the needed carbon sinks to move the nations towards 2050 net zero. Then thirdly, engineers will be needed in ensuring that efficient modern agricultural production along with the establishment, operation and maintenance of agro allied industries are undertaken. And the fourth, is that engineers will need to plan, design, and operate both open cast and underground mines and the mineral processing plants that are essential to add value to the mined owns that are available in huge quantities in all parts of Africa. And the next is that engineers are the ones to build and equip African tourism sites with round the clock electricity, water, and internet facilities. And lastly, engineers are the ones to head manufacturing plants for production of anti-COVID vaccines, personal protective equipment, such other equipment like breathalyzers and related items. So you can see the role of engineers is inevitable for handling uh, sub-Saharan African nations post-COVID pandemic. Mr. Chairman, I want to conclude by emphasizing four points. Number one, COVID-19 pandemic has clearly shown sub-Saharan African nations that they need serious measures to significantly develop their economies such that future pandemics will not take their citizens to near starvation 
and will not allow the economies to slip into recession. Number two, the first action is for the nations to significantly expand their electricity access in line with the global energy transition trends along the lines of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and also in line with the nationally determined contribution we produce, uh, which we have already submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And number three, the unstoppable energy transition will lead to the gradual fall in the demand for oil and gas. And this means that sub-Saharan African nations, about 14 of us, that depend largely on the income from sale of the commodity oil and gas must start from other sources like agriculture, mining, manufacturing, and tourism. And lastly, engineers have a critical role in both the strengthening of the energy sectors with global along the line with uh, global energy transition, as well as in tapping from other sources of foreign exchange earnings for the sub-Saharan African nations in addition to the production of items needed to better manage future pandemics. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Abu Bakar. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation focused on uh, uh, Nigeria, of course, because you are from Nigeria, but also which, which uh, give us also a, a, a good uh, understanding on uh, all the issues uh, met by the sub-Saharan uh, African countries. So now it is a time uh, for discussion. Uh, so uh, I don't know, I, I just want to recall to all the people that uh, you can ask for questions to some speaker uh, by using the chat. I have not seen a question in the, the chat. So uh, I will use my privilege of uh, chair to ask uh, the first question. And uh, the first question uh, will be to, to, to Miguel, if you agree. Uh, and uh, Miguel, uh, you, you speak, uh, you have spoken about uh, some uh, protocols. Uh, and uh, what were the, the main difficulties, the main challenge in your, uh, uh, in your companies uh, in order to implement these uh, protocols? OK. Um, well, we have um, several problems to establish the protocols. Uh, in, in the first place, we, um, as, uh, when, the, when the sanitary um, uh, um, emergency was declared in the country, uh, all the people um, went to the pharmacies to buy uh, hell alcohol, surgeon gloves, um, uh, face masks, and uh, the in, in the country, several pharmacies were run out of, of, of that issues. So it was uh, uh, difficult for the company to, to buy and, and to, to, to reach or to, 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 to those, those issues. Um, um, our company has 5,900 uh, uh, workers and uh, near 3,000 um, outsource workers. So it was difficult for us in, in the first place to, to reach the, the, those issues. In the second place, uh, uh, human resources uh, and, uh, and the board and the chair board has to, the, well, has to discuss with the, with the union, with the workers union, how to uh, implement the protocols because uh, in the country, and I think in, in, in all the world, there was uh, um, uncertainty uh, in, in how you can um, uh, be infected of COVID-19. Um, not, 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 not in, in, in every country or the scientists were uh, uh, trying to discover how the virus uh, was created, how the virus was uh, spread in the world. So um, people were, uh, workers were afraid and, and had fear of getting infected. So um, human resources and um, a medical service and occupational uh, medicine of, of the company have to discuss with the union and the workers how to establish the protocols uh, so, so we can um, um, 
um, implement the protocols uh, to um, uh, certainly uh, mostly with uh, with the uh, with the workforce of um, of of uh, of uh, that 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 work with with uh, going to customer services and 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 uh, with administrative uh, people the problem that we have when we send them uh, from work, work from home is that not everybody has a, a personal computer or a laptop that uh, can connect with the, the network of, of the company. So uh, um, we, um, the, the, the technologies, um, the people of IT uh, have to go um, to the workers' homes how, uh, go to try and try to um, to connect to have connectivity with the uh, with the company network because if you are working at home you have to 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 be able to connect to the company uh, network. Um, it it take um, several time I think that uh, near a month to have all all the the people that were working from home. Um, connected with our with the company network, um, but we I think that we um, we we um, we we were able to 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 work in a different way um, because of the COVID crisis, and um, the customer um, didn't notice that uh, the company was working in a different way. So the, the customer uh, had his energy service, mostly or kindly normal, uh, um, in spite of the COVID crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Uh, okay. Manta, who is a speaker for the next session, has a question for you, and uh, I propose her to, 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 to ask the question by herself. <laughs> Manta, you have the floor. You have to mute, you have to mute. Thank you very much, Chairperson. My question is for Miguel. Uh, you mentioned that in your country, Uruguay, that uh, renewable energy has reached up to 98%. This is very interesting and very encouraging also, and can serve a lesson to many countries. But when we talk of renewable energy, one challenge that we tend to talk about is connectivity. How did you address connectivity? Was it uh, like isolated for groups or have you been able to uh, reach like uh, connectivity on a grid? Can you just elaborate please on that? Um, when, when you ask connectivity uh, is for, for the, um... I, I I think I, I didn't understand your request. For the whole population? Is it for the whole population on the same grid? Yeah, or separate no, grids? No, no, no. no. Um, in, in Uruguay, we have, we have uh, it's for the whole population, yes. And we have only one company, and that company is, is um, was able to reach the connectivity to all the country. We 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 are a small country. We have a, a, a the capital that has the almost the half of the customers um, concentrated in the in the capital in Montevideo, and the rest of the customers and uh, um, in the rest of the country. But we 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 are. We, we reach the connectivity to, to all the customers um, because it, 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 it is not um, wire connectivity or optical connectivity. It's, um, um, I, I don't know how to spell it, um, cellular um, um, by, 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 air, by air. It's the... That uh, is that the answer for your question, Manta? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, Thank you very I, much. I apologize for, for my English. I am a Spanish speaking, so it's not very good. And 
and sometimes I don't have the exact words for 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 the answers. Thank you. It was clear. Thank you. Okay. Miguel, I understand that totally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from uh, Professor Gonke, our uh, president. Uh, so, Professor, do you want to, to set your question? Oh, yes. Our, our question is to both speakers about the percentage um, of uh, <clears throat> the renewable uh, energy and the the, the, the uh, traditional energy and so fossil energy in, in these two countries in different continent. And again, the percentage of uh, hydro, uh, uh, solar, uh, wind, uh, biomass, um, those uh, renewable sources, uh, the percentage of these sources uh, in the part of renewable energy and another question is about nuclear energy. Both of you has not mentioned about nuclear energy. Is there any consideration in these two continents about nuclear energy? So that's my questions. Thank you, okay. Professor Gonke. Abu Bakar, do you want to answer the question? And after Miguel? Can, can I start? Yes. 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 Th yes. Thank you very. Thank you very much. These are very uh, valid questions from the president. I thank you very much for asking them. Actually, I do not have time to discuss, but if you look at the electricity generation expansion plan that I said, uh, the my committee, the Nigerian chapter of World Energy Council produce, you see at the moment, the, the renewable component is just about 30%, while fossil fuel is about seven, actually is about 75, 25%. But by 2050, we have made renewable to be 85 percent, uh, fossil fuel will be about 5 percent, and nuclear about 10 percent. Right now, there's no nuclear component, but we recognize the fact that nuclear has no carbon dioxide emission, and the Nigerian government has a nuclear program, and that's why we put it uh, uh, towards uh, 2035, 2035, 2035, and then 2050. So that's what uh, we provided uh, in that regard. So we're mindful of that. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Babu Bakar. Miguel, do you want to? Well, to... Yes, my, my turn now. In, in, in our country, nu nuclear energy is prohibited by law. Mm -hmm. So we, we and that's, um, um, so we, we have no nu nuclear plants in Uruguay. But uh, also a nuclear plant in Uruguay will be, be, will be uh, use, useless because we have, to only one 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 million one point one point four million customers, and it 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 won't it would be useful. Um, you can you can't uh, build a uh, little nuclear plant. So um, we and if we if we try to build, suppose that it wasn't prohibited by law, and we build a nuclear plant. We, we need to sell the, the, the energy that we don't use to uh, our, our neighbors. Uh, in Argentina and in Brazil, there are nuclear plants. They, they have nuclear plants. So we are near nuclear plants. So the, the, um, if, it's, if it is dangerous for our population, um, we, we have nuclear plants nearby. Um, we, we don't have gas. In Uruguay, we don't have gas. We have to import gas from Argentina or from Bolivia. Uh, our um, thermic uh, units of generation, uh, we have in one, one plant that does, uh, uh, can uh, be fed by gas, but we, uh, as we don't have gas, we feed them by oil. Um, in, in, in percentage, it, um, in, we, we have, um, as, as we say, uh, near 98% uh, renewable energy and um, thermic plants are only used in, in case of emergency. Uh, when we are run out of wind or we are, we are run out of water and, but also or, 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 or at night, if we, have, we don't have solar plants. 
Uh, we don't use coal also in Uruguay. There, are, there is no coal and we have no plants uh, fitted by coal. That's uh, what, I, what I have to say. I, I think- uh, Thank you, I thank have you answered. very much. Okay, go on. Yeah. I, I, I would like to uh, pose a further question about uh, electricity storage. What's the situation oh, now yes. in Uruguay? Well, we 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 have <clears throat> we are um, trying to um, build some uh, um, um, power plants that have uh, an energy storage. It's it it not it's not common in Uruguay, um, but uh, some companies, private companies, are looking forward to. Um, use um, excedents of energy uh, as uh, wind. When 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 we have wind energy uh, excedent, it try and we try to. Uh, they are going. They are studying if there is going to be useful to storage energy, so as to use when we are run out of wind or run out of of of, of the sun, of photovoltaic energy. Um, and also, we are looking forward in Uruguay that I didn't mention um, to use uh, excellent of energy uh, to produce um, hydrogen, green hydrogen. Hydrogen, Thank yes. That, that's it's one of uh, that is a, a, a project for the company, for a company that I work that is studying um, mm -hmm. to. to looking forward to produ produce uh, hydrogen, so as to use it uh, in, in, in other uses as, as it, uh, electric mobility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we using the accident of, of, uh, of wind or of, of photovoltaic energy. And Thank you. Not, not, not hydraulic energy. We, yeah. The water is uh, very important in our country. Yeah. Thank you very much, Miguel. Okay. We have a question from uh, Georgie Spitalnik uh, to Abu Bakar Sambo. Uh, I want to, to welcome Georgie because uh, Georgie is a former uh, president of uh, WFEO. So I am very proud that he is uh, with us. Uh, I, I read the question to Abu Bakar Sambo. What is the yes. effort? What is the effort? Uh, have you read? But uh, uh, what is the effort in your country in developing industries for petrochemicals and gas chemicals that will allow to expand the use of our fossil resources instead of burning them? A good question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I see. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There are two questions actually on the issue of gas flaring. Uh, the government has come up with very heavy fines. And I understand many of the oil companies now have decided to capture the gas and make use of it in two ways. One, to put it in the West African gas pipeline that will deliver gas to Togo, Benin, up to Senegal. That's the plan. And then the other uh, aspect is to use the gas for electricity generation. Uh, so that's one thing. Then I saw on the issue of uh, petrochemicals, uh, and, and others, I want to say two line of activities. One, the government itself has started to take the gas to the hinterland from the Niger Delta to the central part, to the northern part, and that will form the first segment of the much talked about North African gas pipeline that will take gas to Algeria and even sell it to Europe. So that government is already doing that. What some of us are advising the government in view of the unstoppable energy transition and the issue of electric vehicles that will lead to fall in demand for oil and gas, we're telling government to expand the use of oil and gas to petrochemicals, to pharmaceuticals, to fertilizer production, colta, and so on and so forth. And I think our colleagues in the chemical industry and in the petroleum sector are trying to make some proposal for government in that direction. So, the uh, uh, action have been, have been taken in that direction. Thank you very much, Abu Bakar. We have in the chat a question from uh, Karsten Arons, but I think that uh, 
is very close from the question um, of uh, Professor Gonke. So I propose to you to, to go to the next question. Uh, we have a, a question of uh, Engineer Ongolo, Ogolo, sorry, yes. uh, who sent a question to Abu Bakar Sambo. Uh, yes, I've read it. Yes, I've read, read the question, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so um, can you give actually, us a young term? Um, what, uh, you know, in Nigeria today, we have a lot of security problems. We have Boko Haram, we have what we call bandits, and we have unknown gunmen causing a lot of problems. That uh, development, even farmers are afraid of going to their farms. But I want to tell uh, all of you that uh, very recently, the measures taken by government to crush these bandits and terrorists, I think it will uh, uh, yield the desired effect. So many of us that are planning for development, including development of energy, we are not stopping the plans. We are still going with the plans because we think in the next one, two, three years, the issue of banditry will be gone. As a matter of fact, I'm aware that I know you, uh, many of you know the Lake Chad region. Uh, Lake Chad region, there are four countries there, Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. Niger, Cameroon and Chad are taking oil and gas from Lake Chad region. Nigeria is the only country that is not taken. And we understand some security forces. There is going to be two, two battalions of army around that area on the Nigerian side so that uh, they will allow the oil workers to start drilling activities. So government is attending to the security challenge. Engineer Fine Ogolo, thank you for your question. Thank you, Abu Bakr, for the answer. Uh, we have a question from uh, Yu Chang, who say, who asks, uh, are there any solutions for energy saved for computer servers or data centers? Perhaps it's a question, I don't know if either uh, Miguel, either Abu Bakr, either Boss. Um, well, I can answer what, uh, what we do in our country. Um, in, in our country, we have um, one big data center uh, that is situated uh, in the city of Pando, uh, 40 kilometers of the capital. Um, it, it has, uh, um, of course, um, secure energy. Um, it is a, a, a new data center. It yeah, has so, um, four or five years. And uh, it, I, I, I'm not sure if it has uh, uh, batteries um, um, for, for in, in case of um, a, a lockout, a, a, a blackout. But uh, I'm sure that it has uh, generators, oil generators, fuel generators, uh, so as to uh, prevent a blackout and the, uh, and to preserve the, the, the data center. Um, what what we um, 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 uh, what, what we um, um, how do you say uh, what we tell to to customers if they are in 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 uh, in the in in, uh, in the middle of of, of the country or. Uh, where we, where they can um, have um, power cuts, or um, uh, um, several power cuts, or, or 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 daily power cuts, or monthly power cuts, uh, is is to to buy um, an an UPS so that to pre yes. preserve uh, um, uh, the their their. Their, their, their electros, electric uh, power um, so that not to lose uh, data. Um, but uh, it is a very small country. We, we have a very secure energy um, distribution and, and, and service so that we don't need um, to be, um, um, to, to have, Many issues, so that to preserve uh, the data. But um, we 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 don't have we last last year or or, or, or two years ago we we had a um, a very big blackout because of a problem uh, that 
uh, um, uh, in Argentina, and um, but the it 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 it, you, it, it, it lasts uh, almost three or four hours. We have um, more than half of the country without energy, but uh, we very quickly um, um, uh, re re put put energy to all the customers and, and in in all the country, and and it was uh, uh, a big problem for for customers and for data centers. Thank you very much, Miguel. Abouakar, I have another question for you because uh, I think that okay. time is running and I propose yes, to yes. you to answer to the other question. The yes. question is uh, said by uh, Abubakar Barajaj and I think yes. it's a very interesting question. I, I, re I read it also. Yes, I, I will. But I will before uh, asking, I will before answering, the end of, I will read I read the it, end of the question. It. Should an engineer advise us that in fact you have to left in the ground all the fossil energies. <laughs> okay, uh, let me answer. The, in order uh, to produce alternative plants based on the plentiful resource, renewable resource in Africa. And I would add, uh, taking account of the variability of the renewable energy. Well, first of all, I want to answer the uh, previous question very briefly to say that all the major ICT uh, facilities in Nigeria have got their own uninterruptible power system. All of them, most the ones that I know, they've got provision. So they, that in that way, their data is protected. Then on Professor Obakar Bahaj's question, I want to say that, you know, Nigeria is the foremost oil and gas country. The whole economy is based on that. Uh, right now, 90% of foreign exchange finance come from oil and gas. And except now that Nigerian government went to climate change conference uh, 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 in Paris in December, and earlier on, the president of the United Nations in September 2015, he signed the SDGs, and then he was at Paris also, he agreed. And then 2017, the uh, signing was ratified. So it's only because of that, our colleagues, huge number of engineers in oil and gas mellowed down. They piped down a little. And now they are allowing us to make the kind of presentation and make it. And the government is listening to them more than us pushing for renewable energy. And that is why we have to go slowly. And you can see the trick we did is to have an expanded. You can't have a sharp change. If you tell them to stop using oil and gas, it will not work. My colleagues who have joined Fine Ogolo, just ask him, he will answer you. It has to be gradual, Professor Bahaj. It can be sharp change. If we do a sharp change, we will be driven away. The president will drive me away and say, get out. You know? So it has to be slowly, 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 slowly. And I think we'll be there. When they go to the meetings, now uh, I think about 100 of us are uh, planning to go to Glasgow for the climate change conference. And I deliberately, selected about 20 oil and gas people to go to the meeting. The idea is for them not to listen to me, their friend, their colleague, but to hear from people from advanced countries and other developing countries like UAE, like Malaysia, they are talking beautifully on this uh, renewable energy and climate change. When they come back, I think they will change. So with time, we change. Now we manage to push the nuclear. Some of our colleagues don't like nuclear, but we campaign to them. Nuclear is good, it is okay. We have signed with France, we have signed agreement with Russia, and we should implement, go ahead to implement those ones. So we have to go gradual, Professor Bahaj. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, unhappily, we have no more time to go on this discussion because we have another session now. Uh, I want to thank you very much, our two speakers, uh, Miguel and Abu Bakar. It was the first uh, very interesting uh, presentation and then uh, a, a very good discussion. And I want to to thank you also all the, uh, the people who have asked for some questions. Uh, and uh, well, I, I think uh, I am very happy with the first session and I have no doubt about the fact that the following will be very good also. And it is uh, the way to go to the second session of our meeting. Thank you again, uh, Miguel and Abu Bakar. The second session of our meeting, meeting is uh, dedicated to the la a larger definition for resilience and uh, a new understanding of, of risk. 
And uh, we will have also uh, two speakers, uh, one from UK with uh, Andre Andrew McNaughton and uh, 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 Manta uh, Devi Naubus, who come from Mauritius. Uh, so I will begin to give the floor uh, first to Andrew. Uh, Andrew uh, McNaughton is an infrastructure partner to Axel in UK. And uh, I propose uh, to you, uh, Andrew, to take the floor and to give us uh, our, our, your presentation. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, give me one second while I uh, while I prepare the uh, my slides. If you yes. bear with me, one second, please. Uh, we see something. <laughs> yeah. One second for me. Okay. You see that? It's okay. Good. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you for the opportunity to present to uh, to the conference today. Uh, fascinating uh, set of questions that I just listened to, and, and particularly around. Uh, energy transition. Uh, the topic I'd like to cover is, is particularly around um, the delivery of, of infrastructure more generally. And uh, you, you, you touched on the topic of, of risk, um, and I'm gonna come on to some specifics uh, around that. So as we know, infrastructure projects are there to provide a service to the community and to society. And they increasingly involve an intervention into an existing operating network with the purpose of increasing either the user experience or the efficacy of the operating network. And that can be true for whether it's in power, transportation, healthcare, communications, whatever the infrastructure it happens to be. When you look at international studies into infrastructure, uh, there is something in the region of 70% of major or even mega projects actually disappoint their owners. They disappoint them either in terms of time, cost or performance in the outcome, all of which impacts on the ultimate business case that was originally set out. Early last year in 2020, uh, we embarked on a study on behalf of the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK into this particular issue of the lack of performance and possible improvements. And I'd like to share some thoughts on the work that we've been doing in the institution uh, that, was, that took place through last year and was published at, towards the end of last year. The study itself, a systems approach to infrastructure delivery is available on the ICE website um, for you to be able to look at in detail. For the study, we undertook, uh, that we undertook, we not only looked at the portfolio of infrastructure projects, but we also started from the hypothesis on the nature of infrastructure projects in the future. And the hypothesis was divided into three parts. Firstly, that infrastructure as a whole is beginning to become more and more dependent on technology. Secondly, if we apply systems thinking to infrastructure effectively, it makes a real difference to the delivery of projects into operation. And thirdly, there are lessons that could be learned from other industries. The study, as I said, which concluded last year, came out in support of all three of those assumptions, and particularly the first one, that technology is becoming steadily more prevalent and dominant, in fact, in infrastructure. When we look at new infrastructure that we build, we're also building in resilience to future, future issues such as the climate change uh, and, uh, and carbon resilience. But what about the rest? Almost 90% of the infrastructure that we have in, in the world already, already exists and has, has been there for years, if not decades. And we need to actually consider the interventions that we need in order to make that as resilient as new, as new infrastructure can be. But in the built environment, we can also envisage a day when an infrastructure project has very little or any civil engineering or structural engineering activity. More and more, an infrastructure project is an upgrade or an intervention into a network of a new, with a, with a new or an emerging technology, or it's a, a new ev evolution of the life cycle of technology that's been put into operation. So we need to think very differently about how we go about the delivery of such projects, where technology is the large and dominant piece of, of what we do. Through the study, we came up with eight interesting overall principles that I'd like to take you through briefly. And what I'm going to use through the slides that we have here is, is an infographic that we developed to, to illustrate them. Now, both, as I say, the full report and the infographic can be found on, on the website together with an animation which, which talks you through it. The eight principles can be summarized as follows. We need to be more and more focused on the outcome of the infrastructure rather than just building the structure itself. We have to bear in mind, that what, mind the outcome that is expected and clients or asset owners need to have the ability to articulate that outcome all the way through the supply chain. 
in order to ensure that everybody is aligned around it. Also, as decisions are made throughout the life of the project, they must be referred all the way back to the initial planned outcome. We have to ensure that a decision either aligns with the outcome or that the change is done in a deliberate manner and properly recorded. Secondly, there are things that, that there are certainly ways in which we can learn from other industries. We concluded that we should look to close the gap of knowledge between other industries and bring the lessons learned into infrastructure. Industries like aerospace and defense have for some time been further ahead in thinking about how they should apply the lessons from, from a systems approach. The next principle is that, is that there, are, there are certain things that only a client or an asset owner can, can do. And they need to be able to articulate a number of elements that are associated with the project. There are two that come to mind, and I'll speak about the second one concerning data in a short while. But the first one is the appetite for innovation. We have to understand what the appetite for new technology is and how that plays a part in the development of a project. We have to remember that there are different time constants in the development of various aspects of a project. We normally focus most of our time on the civil engineering element as opposed to the technology pieces, but these all need to come together at the same time. The fourth principle is, is the implementation of systems thinking. With that in mind, we need to have a much stronger, stronger focus on the implementation of systems engineering. Starting again with the outcome and working backwards through the project, this means that from the outset, we can organize the project to be delivered in the right way. Not only in terms of procurement models and incentivization for each party, but also the interaction and interface definition between the various parties. The ability to understand and manage the risks associated with those parties is crucial. In applying systems thinking, we need to fully appreciate the risks in terms of productivity, not just with elements such as civil engineering, but increasingly those in associated with emerging technology. Elements that are part of the overall system. Despite infrastructure pro programs spanning many years, we have to fully understand the research and development cycle for technology, those technologies that are chosen to support the outcome, the interfaces between those different technology elements and the de degree of pre-commissioning testing required in order for the whole system to function correctly. That brings us next to the next principle, which is about being shovel, shovel ready. It's a phrase that's often used in infrastructure that many people look to have projects that are, that are shovel ready in order for them to be, uh, to be commenced. But through the project, we emerged the concept of the, of the phrase shovel worthy, because we have to start the project at a point in time where all of those elements that I've described come together. There has to be enough front end engineering, front end loading, or left shift thinking, whatever we want to call it, that has to be done in preparation for the project. And this has to be done in sufficient time before we start, we commence on projects uh, on, on sites so that they will be delivered and we will maintain the outcome as well as the cost and program, ultimately delivering the customer's requirements. When we consider, system into, when we consider systems thinking, we have to also focus on system integration. We need to think about the commissioning of complex te technology dependent projects. It leads to the fact that system integration is rarely considered enough in detail in infrastructure projects. The UK government's Infrastructure and Projects Authority developed a route map in 2014 for major projects. It's a very useful best practice guide for project initiation and delivery. However, when this was refreshed earlier this year with the systems approach in mind, it was noted that there was no guidance module relating to systems integration. So only seven years ago, system integration was not considered important in the delivery of complex infrastructure. In the refreshed map, it now is. We need to consider system integration from the outset of projects and have it as part of the DNA. System integration processes help us to identify those interfaces between elements of the system and to manage them effectively. As I've noted earlier, the development cycle for individual elements will differ. Focusing on system integration will identify elements that need specific focus and investment early in the project life cycle to ensure adequ adequate modeling and testing. This is very much linked to the innovation appetite uh, that I mentioned earlier 
and the outcomes that are defined. The next principle I'd like to cover is leadership. Leadership is, is crucial in delivery of, of any projects and particularly complex ones. And it featured a lot in the study. In terms of infrastructure, we still lead projects in the civil engineering domain in the way that we have done for decades, but we have to think differently. We have to think what the leadership models should be for projects. In particular, we need to recognize the capabilities and skills of leadership in the project management team, such that the whole team is able to understand the different technologies that are going to be implemented. The leadership must also give sufficient of what we call voice to the various aspects of the project at the right point in time in the development. We also need to think about future leadership models. Do we have a single leader all the way through the life of the project or multiple leaders with designed and planned baton changes at certain points in the, in the project? The last point to consider is data. Once again, client or asset owners need to own the data architecture and requirements. With ever increasing availability of data uh, to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of operations and the maintenance of infrastructure, the owner needs to set out the key elements required and ideally define the common data requirement to be utilized throughout the life of the project through its delivery and also into its operations. This process has been designed as the golden thread going through the life of a project. However, it must be considered as more than this. And through the study, we involved the concept of a golden loop. If an infrastructure project is an intervention into an operating system, which they increasingly are and increasingly will be, then the data requirements flow out of the existing operation, operating system into the project and then flow back into the augmented operating system on commissioning in order for the improvements to the network to be delivered and that desired outcome to be realized by the owner. Now, I hope that gives you some background to the study that was published, as I say, in December last year. We're continuing to work on, on, on the topic in three specific areas. First of all, we're having a series of briefings to industry leaders across the UK and elsewhere in the world, um, which is creating a forum to, to, to gain knowledge and to spread the knowledge about the concept of system thinking. In addition, we're having a specific examination on leadership competencies for complex projects. And this is being led by the Institution of Civil Engineers with other organizations contributing. And finally, we have a follow-up report focusing on case studies for particular projects that we anticipate will bring these principles to life for everybody. So look out for the, uh, the second report that should be published um, later this year. If I conclude, irrespective of, of short-term issues that we see around the world at this time and in a post-pandemic world, infrastructure is absolutely an enabler of economic growth and necessary to support the growth and mobility of the population. This is a fact across the world. Our choice of infrastructure delivery must recognize and support the sustainable goals uh, that have been set for us. The purpose of the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK is to harness the powers of nature for the use and convenience of mankind. And this assumes an endure, enduring planet that is harnessing nature, not destroying it. Technology used in infrastructure is advancing at speed. And it can be argued that the pace of change in technology will never be this slow again. Projects are more complex with the physical infrastructure being just an element in a system of systems. Risk management is key to all of this and linked to a system approach, the definition of the elements of a project and their interfaces and the effective integration is critical to, to delivery success. Throughout the life of infrastructure, technology will continue to develop and there needs to be a really careful plan to accept and to implement the changes in technology. For example, if I look at the uh, transport, rail transportation network in, in the UK, the physical infrastructure was built in, in the 1830s. And since that time, we still use that physical infrastructure largely, largely as it was built. However, the technology has changed many times in, those, uh, in, those, in the last 200 years. Taking leadership, the skills of project leaders and the culture of projects organizations must evolve recognizing the, the, the role of technology in, in these projects and the fact that we're integrating really complex systems into projects. So in my view, individuals and companies that in, embrace the concept of system thinking for infrastructure have massive opportunities for the future. John Oates, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Andrew, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and I think uh, I am sure that we will have a, a lot of questions to you in order to understand how this kind of methodology could be included in other fields. Uh, we will proceed uh, like uh, for uh, like uh, uh, as uh, for the first session, and I propose to go directly to the second presentation. And after we will have questions for uh, the, the two speakers. So the second presentation will be proposed by uh, Manta David Naubus. Uh, Manta is associate professor uh, at the University of Mauritius. She's also the head of the civil engineering department. Uh, Manta, you have the floor for this presentation about uh, mapping spatial vulnerability of the elderly to a health, health pandemic. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I am Manta Naubert, and I'm presently the head of the Civil Engineering Department. And for today, I'm representing the Institution of Engineer Mauritius, to which I'm a member. I'd like to thank the Institution of Engineers for having given me this opportunity. And thank you very much, WFU, for this opportunity and for it to be able to share with you the findings of a study that we carried out. And I would say that uh, we are actually sharing the voice of the community. And this is something that can be mainstream in development projects, in the development of infrastructures and cities. So the title of the presentation is Mapping Spatial Vulnerability of the Elderly to a Health Pandemic. And uh, this is a topic which is going to be challenging the engineering community to develop more resilient cities. So the rationale behind the study, first of all, is that casualty recorded worldwide indicated that the elderly are most at risk to the COVID-19 disease. And th this is why we actually tried to see how this pandemic was in fact affecting the day-to-day -day life of one of the most vulnerable group of our society, the elderly. So the aims and objectives of the study, first of all, was the aim to capture the challenges faced by the elderly during COVID-19 health pandemic, especially for better preparedness in the future. Hopefully we don't face these type of pandemics, but we need to be better prepared. And uh, we define our objectives, firstly, to conduct field surveys with the elderly, to extract vulnerability indicators from published census data and to develop vulnerability maps at district, ward and village level. So during our search, our literature review, we noted that there were four main health risk factors, age, gender, comorbidity and response of the immune system with regards to the groups which are more affected. And all these main health risk factors thus place the elderly in the category of those most at risk to the health pandemic. And with regards to risk re reduction strategies, which have been implemented in many countries and also in Mauritius, there was the complete lockdown and also the partial lockdown, vaccination uh, program, which are still ongoing, and also investment in the health sector. So these were the three main risk reduction strategies. And we also appreciated that, and this is why we wanted to share it, that social vulnerability <laughs> maps do support health risk reduction strategies. And this is a tool yeah. which is yet to be encouraged. So for this study, we carried out field surveys in two parts of the island, two different villages. Okay, one, as you can see, located in the south of the island and another one located more in the center of the island, close to the city center. And uh, the number of elderly in those villages, oh, and we need to note that the, the census that we could use well, we was a, a, a the census of 2011, <laughs> because this is the latest published census. The next one is going to be out next year. And uh, these are two different villages, one middle size and one small size village. 
And uh, we devised questionnaires with uh, questions which were more like indicators, 23 indicators. And those 23 indicators were mostly to assess, to gauge the coping capacity of the elderly. So questions were around access to basic needs, living conditions, health conditions, mobility, support facilities, and communication facilities. Now for the most vulnerable group, group like the elderly, access to basic needs, good living conditions, support facilities, communication facilities are very important to ensure that they do get a safe living uh, conditions, livelihood, I would say. So these were some of the questions that we actually requested uh, us for. And uh, the key findings of the field survey, there were many of them. Some of the indicators reflect, were reflecting low vulnerabilities. So many of them had children, children were supporting them and uh, access to water and electricity, 100% access. They had access to phone, but less had access to internet facilities. 40 of them had their own transport. With regards to income, they had a per, like a regular income. So 80% normally receive social support from friends, from family, from neighbors. But we also noted that there was indicators which were reflecting higher vulnerabilities in terms of education levels, in terms of comorbidity, 58 suffered from non-communicable diseases. 18% find it medium to, uh, difficult to access basic food. 48 find it difficult to access cooking gas uh, facilities. And 27 were affected by reduced mobility. So overall, 44% of those surveyed found it difficult to cope with the pandemic. Now this uh, survey, we didn't stop here. We continued because this was just a sample. And we made use of the geospatial technology. And together with that, we used the census data. So what we did was we took the actual field data. We analyzed the field data in more detail using multivariate analysis. And it was noted that those uh, data, the data collected during the field survey, the vulnerability indicators, if you remember, there were 23 of them. They could, they could be grouped into four main factors, living conditions, access to basic facilities, mobility, and economic conditions. So these understanding, these groups, these four factors were then translated to the secondary data, that is the latest published census data, which is of 2011. And we had the social factors, so we extracted a total of 14 indicators from the census data because we wanted to see the related vulnerability at the level of the whole island. And uh, each the, the methodology is that each of the social vulnerability indicators were associated with a weightage as indicated. And then they were combined and ranked according to percentiles and eventually classified in terms, well, with the help of GIS map. So this chart here gives slightly more information about the normalization of the data and eventually how they were combined. And uh, they were grouped in percentile, small, medium, medium, high to high. And then finally, they were combined at district level. So we had the low, medium, medium, high, and high. And then we did the same thing at ward level, because data is also collected at ward level. By the way, Mauritius covers a total of 2,000 kilometers squared in surface area. So as far as information is concerned, they are quite detailed information. And we can see that the high vulnerable, vulnerable group, okay, the, the ward which fall under the category of high, highly vulnerable areas, they could be spread anywhere along the coast, in the center, close to the city center. So because our focus was more on the vulnerable group of the society. Now we even went further for as comparison. We wanted to show that 
when we compared the data, the results of the analysis from district to ward level, we can note that at district level, often there can be enough facilities, but at community level, not everybody has the means to access all facilities. This is why the vulnerability changes as the scale of analysis changes. And this is an information that has to be brought out in the, to the surface so that concerned authorities do appreciate that. Now, the how does that study with the information gathered from the community, with the information obtained from the census data, how does that present the challenges for the engineering community? So the first question that we started asking ourselves is that, is the current development model of cities addressing the needs of the elderly, the needs of the aging societies, because in many countries, we do have that problem of an aging society, and the need of vulnerable groups, not only elderly, we can have other vulnerable groups. Are concerned authorities able to locate vulnerable groups quickly to provide support? And is the healthcare system adapted to reaching those with limited mobility? And the elderly is a clear example of those groups we, who are affected often with limited mobility. And the full lockdown periods during the health pandemic have taught it a lot. It has actually taught us lots of uh, information where well, our strength, where well, are our drawbacks. So what really have we learned during that period of COVID-19? So the need for re-engineering the support systems in cities would be one major uh, observation that the group had. So we noted that there is a need for more information technology and connectivity so that we can build more resilient systems because Hazards, even natural hazards and the health pandemic would probably unfortunately be part of our life in the future. So we need more resilient system and connectivity would be key to that. Technology would be key to that because we've seen that during the lockdown, during the pandemic, the e-business has really provided much support in many areas, even in e-education. So connectivity and IT would be important. So businesses which address the needs of the most vulnerable groups of the society, the e-business for food supplies, for gas. So these business should review the way they actually do operating because there should be both model, which is happening in the education sector. I'm myself from the education sector, I would uh, confirm that we are actually working with both models because we never know when we have to switch overnight to one particular model, especially the E1. How can the healthcare reach out to the vulnerable groups? How do they have to reinvent themselves so that they can reach out instead of waiting for vulnerable groups to come to them because they have to reach out in difficult situation? We need a more adapted transport system which is going to provide more easier access because during pandemic, the most vulnerable groups, one of their concern is mobility. Can they go to have uh, facilities? Can they go to the healthcare centers without being facing the risk of uh, being contaminated? Okay, so the most vulnerable groups should be at the core of design of cities if we want to build resilient system. And with that, because there's going to be connectivity, because there's going to be more facilities that would be required. We are talking here of more energy intensive systems. Hence, the need for more investment on research and implementation of renewable energy systems for a country. This because since we have to develop resilient systems, these would be more energy intensive, so we need to be prepared, okay? So our concluding remarks is that for a country to flourish, like the SDGs, the Sendai framework always emphasize, we should leave no one behind. So many countries are actually experiencing aging population, 
So we need to be more prepared and the COVID-19 pandemic with all the measures which have been taken to control it have shown us that we need a different model, different development model. So we need more efficient systems to reduce additional stress on limited resources. So we, we would agree that resources are often limited. So if we rely too much on the resources, the effectiveness will go out, go down. So that's why we need more efficient system. Again, connectivity is going to be one of them. And there is a need to mainstream climate change impacts to develop resilient infrastructure and to develop for the welfare of the community. Not just develop, but develop taking, putting the, especially the community, but especially the vulnerable group at the center so that we can mainstream the impacts of climate change for the welfare of the community. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. So this is the research team and all those who have contributed to making this project su successful and to the completion of the project. Okay? So thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanta. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation, which gave us a, a different way to, to discuss about uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, you, you have uh, dealt with uh, some issues, some concerns, which are very interesting. And I am sure that uh, we will come back on this issue during the, the discussion, of course. Thank so uh, there are, uh, please, now it is time for the question for our two speakers. And, uh, I see that there is already a question from our uh, president, uh, Professor Gonke. Professor Gonke, do you want to take the floor and ask your question, please? Okay, I just want to know uh, what is the percentage of the elderly people uh, <clears throat> uh, from the survey uh, to have the access to internet? Because uh, during the pandemic in China, uh, the smartphone uh, is is you is required to show the 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 uh, the track of the people if they have uh, close contact with uh, affected people and so on and so forth, and then at that time the elderly people in China met the problem. They may don't have smartphone or uh, not able to uh, use the apps uh, for showing the their their travel uh, travel tracks. So. Uh, I wonder what is the percentage uh, <clears throat> in your survey of the elderly people have access to internet? Thank you very much for this question, President. Uh, Manta, if I can add a, a point yes, uh, on the question of uh, Professor Gonke, uh, I, I think it is a very important issue, of course, and I want just to underline the same kind of question in France during the, the pandemic. When we when began uh, when it began the time for vaccine for vaccination. Uh, the, uh, the authorities in France have chosen uh, internet to, 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 to take a rendezvous in order to get the vaccine. And what we have seen very concretely is that in some part of France, there were a, a lower rate of, of uh, rendezvous because there were a lower access to internet. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, perhaps it's not a, a link with the elderly people, but there is an issue on that. There is a link between uh, these two issues. Manta, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you very much, Chairperson. And thank you very much, uh, President, for this uh, question. Yes, uh, from our survey, we've noted that 67% of all those surveyed have confirmed that they have internet. But having internet and living with the children, they may not be the one actually using it. That's the problem. Now, when the children are living together with them, the support is there, okay? They're going to get the support. And many of them confirm that they do get the support. But often they have connectivity in the building itself, it's there when the children come, but they themselves may not be familiar with that, okay? So we do have an education to do here. We do have to prepare our people because we may never know overnight what can happen. Yeah, we do. We've seen that and uh, we do, uh, let's say, uh, want to share that information and so that something can be done in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manta. Is there uh, other question in the, 
in the chat about uh, for our for our speakers not yet so uh, i have a question uh, to 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 andrew if you what you have proposed uh, is a uh, is a in your presentation is a, a kind of a, i i don't know if i will use the right word but uh, what you have proposed is, is a presentation of first uh, uh, the presentation of a system approach for uh, to infrastructure uh, delivery uh, is it applicable for all the area of uh, infrastructure thank you thank you for the question chair um in my view and, and, and certainly from the the work that we did last year it's applicable for any piece of infrastructure um because if we if we approach the uh, if we approach uh, infrastructure in a, thinking of it as a system then we can actually break down many things even if you think of some of the work that uh, that Manta has, has described, the, the study work that they did um, around the elderly, even, even that in itself is a system. It's a series of elements which connect together. Um, and so when you actually look at a piece of infrastructure, whether it's a, whether it's a fairly straightforward piece of infrastructure or very complex, um, you can break it down into a series of elements which all have interfaces and connect together. And very often it's the interfaces which are the pieces where the risks are. Um, so in my view, it, it applies not only to infrastructure, it applies much more broadly to our, to our, to our, uh, our society. Um, that if we start thinking of the world as a system and how it's connected, we have a much greater understanding of how they, how they work together. Okay, thank you very much. No other question uh, from uh, the participant? So perhaps I can use my privilege of chairman to, to ask another question to Manta. Uh, following what you have presented uh, to, to us, uh, what is the highest concern of uh, the elderly uh, and how can the engineering community address this concern? Yeah, thank you very much, Chairperson. Now, we've noted that the highest concern of the elderly, because they often have problems of health comorbidity, one of the highest concern is access to health facilities. And uh, access to health facilities when they go out, if ever they are able to manage and go out to the healthcare centers, they face the risk of being contaminated. So that's why we were emphasizing on the need to reach out to them the need of the healthcare system to be able to reach out to the elderly during a difficult situation. And connectivity, facilities, networking would be important so that the elderly face less difficulty to get their medication, to get the, the support that they need with regards to the health, because for them is very critical. So, this would be one of the concerns. Thank you. And how, maybe I'll add to something, how the engineering community will need, can do something, is where the engineering community has to review the way they design a city. The way they design a city often doesn't take care of the fact that some people have reduced mobility. Well, they, I'm not saying they, we, we design the cities. We don't often realize that some people don't have the same facilities and elderly vulnerable groups have to be at the center of design of infrastructures, design of a whole system that support the cities. So elderly have to be at the center. Thank you. You're on mute, mute Chairman. You're on mute, please. Chairperson. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, yes. Thank you very much for your answer, uh, Manta. Following your, your answer, um, I, I, could you give us some example of on the way to to implement this kind of uh, of development in the city? For example, uh, is IoT a part of the solution, and how can you think about the integration of this kind of technology when you think about the design of the cities, for example? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, the smart cities nowadays make a lot of use of internet uh, things. And smart cities have put much emphasis on being able to get information readily because it's all connected. 
the transport system is connected, certain facilities are connected. So you can get that maybe with, with the help of a mobile phone. So instead of just focusing, because we've learned how to do it while developing smart cities. So these concepts should be from part of the whole city, retrofitting okay, existing cities, because it's no longer, as we would say, a luxury, it's a necessity. And the good is that we've already learned how to do it, making use of Internet of Things connectivity. We've already learned how to do it so that uh, we can uh, identify the vulnerable groups within our system, like geospatial system can be used, online geospatial system can be used to identify the location of the people. And also the people, the vulnerable groups can send the information what sort of support they need, and so that people can easily reach out to them. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a look on the. Yes, there is a question from. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, could, could you read uh, the, in the chat uh, the question? Yes, from I'm, the Luch I'm actually reading that. Yeah. Uh, what, what are, are some measures May that I? the engineering community has thought about uh, for the elderly, elderly people who are not able to attend health center to be treated or any other needs that are not only uh, available at the center with an obviously high risk of being contaminated by the COVID-19 virus? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And here, yes, for this question, I would like to, to share an information. Now, there is a, a program, vaccination program in Mauritius, whereby it's the health center which go, they go around in the community, okay, with all their facilities and come house to house to help the community. Now, during a, the, a health pandemic like COVID, the risk of contamination is going to be there. So the risk of contamination would be there. And the importance is for communication, ease of communication. This is what, what is important. Ease of communication should be facilitated both from the healthcare center and also from the community. As it is, we get information, let's say from the media, but it's, it is not interactive. So we need more interactive systems so that the, the vulnerable groups not only elderly, vulnerable group, uh, people should be able to have that direct communication with the healthcare center and be able to voice out their problem, their concern. And then the, there should exist a system because only the healthcare center cannot operate alone. There should be a system like connectivity. That's why we're talking about transport, more smart transport systems together with the healthcare so that we can reach out to the community. Okay. Thank you very much for this question, Mrs. Lachmi. Thank you, Manta. Is there no other question uh, in the chat? So perhaps I May can... I? Oh, yes, Professor Gonke. Yeah, I raised my hand. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. By the uh, mentioning of ICT, uh, uh, technology, digital technology by Manta, I would like to uh, extend a question to Andrew. Uh, take UK as example. To what extent the uh, digital technologies such as big data, uh, internet of things, uh, artificial intelligence has been used in uh, improve the, uh, the, the infrastructure, especially uh, the energy infrastructure? Thank you for your question. Um, I think the uh, I, I think to be total to be completely uh, frank and honest about it, I think we are still in our in the early days of being able to use um, the, the the data that exists into turning it into intelligent decision making, um, and I think that goes across all sectors of, of infrastructure. Um, I think there's now strong moves right the way across uh, the industry in, in the UK, where w there is an understanding that we have you know very very large amounts of data. That's now available. That's coming from from operating systems, whether it be energy, um, or for transportation, or for any any other form of infrastructure. Um, and there's a huge connectivity, as you say. There are there are many things through the Internet of Things that are now connected, which are able to provide 
data for effective operation and maintenance. Um, what we now have to do is to turn that into proper management information and, and predictive maintenance and predictive measures. Um, there are many, many tools now that are, that are evolving. And, and I think one of, the, one of the issues for, I guess, for the engineering community and particularly for advisory communities is to, is to help the asset owners to understand the tools they need. Um, because uh, I, I see at the moment many, many, uh, many asset owner organizations that have the data, but they need to turn it into intelligent decision making. Um, so I think we now have we now have the pieces of the jigsaw, but it's it's for us as the engineering community to help uh, owners to uh, to make the right decisions. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, this answer. I have a look on the chat and nothing new. So uh, perhaps uh, if you allow me uh, a, a, a last question uh, to to Andrew. Uh, how do you think that uh, the, the leadership models will need to change in the, the system approach? And uh, does it apply uh, across all the supply chain? I think the, uh, the, the models, as I said, I alluded to in my, uh, in my presentation, that we still, we still lead infrastructure projects in a very traditional way. Um, I am a civil engineer myself, and, uh, and many of my colleagues believe that it's the, it's the domain of civil engineers to lead very complicated projects. Um, the models that need to change is, is to actually take the skill sets that, that understand complexity and understand how systems operate. And those, those don't necessarily sit in any particular domain, whether it be civil engineering, any other form of engineering. Um, we can have highly competent individuals that can lead projects, provided they have the understanding of how the system operates and that how we manage risks across those. Um, and undoubtedly, there is, a, there is a sense that says we often look to the, uh, to the asset owners and the, and the clients in, in, in uh, commissioning infrastructure for them to have this, this form of leadership. But to be truthful, where we have technology interacting with, uh, with civil engineering, that kind of that model of leadership has to pass all the way through the supply chain because we have to have everybody with that form of understanding of, of how complex uh, the, uh, the environment is and particularly where it's an emerging technology and we understand how it has to develop. So I think uh, that the models that will change, will, will, we will look at different, different individuals uh, and particularly, particularly not just individuals, but groups of people who will lead projects. Uh, and, and I think we will see uh, a new project leadership model emerging in the future. Thank you, Andrew, for this, uh, this answer. We have not so, we are not so far from the end of our meeting. I have perhaps the time for a, 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 a last. If there is oh yes, there is another question from uh, Luchmi. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I think that the question is for our uh, two speakers perhaps. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be better for the near future to be having engineer englobing a wider domain? What a question. <laughs> I don't yeah, want... I'd like to start. <laughs> yeah. Anta. Thank you very much, person. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, engineers having an englobing a wider domain may, for me may not be the, the way forward. We're talking here of multidisciplinary groups now. It's no, uh, together with having a speciality is good, like civil engineering, also I'm a civil engineer, but we're talking of multidisciplinary groups and also people having an education which goes both vertical and horizontal so that we can understand the, the, the speciality of each other because without multidisciplinary uh, tra training, we won't be able to reach where we have to go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Monta. Uh, Andrew, have you? Thank you. I, I, I can only completely agree with 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 Manta's point of view. And I think um, I think it, it's an interesting it's an interesting proposal that maybe engineers become broader in what they in, in what they do. Um, but I, I think it's also interesting that the, the phrase was used for the near future. It may be for the near future, but we have to think long term, and we have to plan for the future and be uh, in order that we can deliver the kind of projects we need. Um, and that's the bit, that's the thing we have to face now. Yes. I, I, I share this point of view that, uh, uh, of course, it's very important today to have a, a holistic approach for every every concern, every issue. 
but we know that uh, today the complexity of the world is uh, such that it's quite impossible to have engineers who are able to deal with all these issues together. So it, it's of course a, 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 it's a good conclusion for uh, and a good a good conclusion for this session and perhaps a, a very strong message from this symposium that uh, when we think about uh, the training of our engineer. We are uh, just at the end of uh, this uh, meeting, so I want to use, uh, I would be happy to use uh, the, the last uh, minute uh, just uh, to thank you very much, uh, Manta and Andrew, for uh, their uh, participation to this session, which was a, a difficult session, but a very interesting one. Uh, and I think that your uh, two presentations were very different, but uh, give us uh, two different uh, ways to deal with this issue of. Uh, of the vulnerability of the risk in our systems. So I want also to thank very also to thank all the participants. I want to underline that uh, we will close uh, the symposium today, but there is a follow up tomorrow, tomorrow at the same time, because the idea would be to have, as we are a global organization, a global symposium. And so we have to deal with, uh, with the, 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 the gap between our way of living. Uh, so uh, we have chosen a, a short, uh, a short uh, time every day. So thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, participation. Thank you, Professor Gonke, to be with us. And uh, see you tomorrow at the same time. Thank you. Have a thank good you. day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.